The Virginia Tech tragedy bears a, a little more commentary. Um, I wrote something about 10 days after Columbine with Sut Jolly that, we, that was published in the Boston Globe. And I want to read a, just a few paragraphs from it because it's so unbelievably related to the events of the past week in Virginia Tech. So please bear with me. Sut and I wrote, it is tempting to look at the murderous attack in Littleton as a manifestation of individual pathologies, an isolated incident involving deeply disturbed teenagers who watched one too many video games. That explanation ignores larger social and historical forces and is dangerously short-sighted. Littleton is an extreme case, but if we examine critically the cultural environment in which boys are being socialized and trained to become men, such events might not appear so surprising. Political debate and media coverage keep repeating the muddled thinking of the past. Headlines and stories focus on youth violence, kids killing kids, or as in the title of a CBS 48 Hours special, Young Guns. This is entirely the wrong framework to use in trying to understand what happened in Littleton or in Jonesboro, Arkansas, Paducah, Kentucky, Pearl, Mississippi, Springfield, Oregon, and I will add um, Blacksburg, Virginia. This is not a case of kids killing kids. This is boys killing boys and boys killing girls. That these, what, that these, what these school shootings reveal is not a crisis in youth culture or among young people, but a crisis in masculinity. The shootings are telling us something about how we are doing as a society, much like the canaries in coal mines whose deaths were a warning to the miners that the caves were unsafe. Consider what the reaction would have been if the perpetrators in Littleton had been girls. The first thing everyone would have wanted to talk about would have been, why are girls, not kids, acting out violently? What is going on in the lives of girls that would lead them to com commit such atrocities? All of the explanations would flow from the basic premise that being female was the dominant variable. But when the perpetrators are boys, we talk in a gender neutral way about kids or children. And few, with the exception of some feminist scholars, delve into the forces, be they cultural, historical, or institutional, that produce hundreds of thousands of physically abusive and violent boys every year. Instead, we call upon the same tired specialists who harp about the easy accessibility of guns, the lack of parental supervision, the culture of peer group exclusion and teasing, or the prevalence of media violence. All of these factors are, of course, relevant, but they, if they were the primary answers, then why are girls who live in the same environment not responding in the same way? The fact that violence, whether of the spectacular kind represented in the school shootings or the more routine murder, assault, and rape, is an overwhelmingly male phenomenon should indicate to us that gender is a vital factor, perhaps the vital factor. Looking at violence as gender neutral has the effect of blinding us as we desperately search for clues about how to respond. What this case reinforces is our crying need for a national conversation, someone said this earlier, about what it means to be a man since cultural definitions of manhood and masculinity are ever shifting and are particularly volatile in the contemporary era. Scrolling down, there may, need, may indeed be no simple explanation as to why certain boys or young men in particular circumstances act out in violent, sometimes lethal ways. But leaving aside the specifics of this latest case, the fact that the overwhelming majority of such violence is perpetrated by males suggests that part of the answer lies in how we define such intertwined concepts as respect, power, and manhood. When you add on the easy accessibility of guns and other weapons, you have all the ingredients for the next deadly attack. And I'm saying this because I, because I have a public platform to say this, and so few progressive and feminist voices are allowed dis, a part of the discourse about these school shootings. It's pathetic. There's a teachable moment, and the teachable moments come and go all the time. There's a huge teachable moment. So many people are focused on Virgi the Virginia Tech massacre, right? But there's so little thoughtful commentary about it. And I thought one thing that I should do is, even though a lot of people here are already progressive, thoughtful, feminist, it's important that whenever we have the opportunity to say this, we say it. Because it's not being said very much at all in the mainstream media discourse. It's an incredible ideological exclusion of feminist understanding of the world from the mainstream media uh, conversation. How many criminal profilers do we have to listen to, and FBI types, and security types, when they can't, when they can't bring on a feminist, a sociologist, of somebody who has a structural analysis, who has an un analysis of gender, and, and it could, could connect individual male pathology? It happens everywhere you look. And now, you could say that a case like Virginia Tech, this 
young man, clearly mentally ill, and it is an extreme case. But as we know, those of us who work in this world, those extreme cases are only the sort of the, the extreme tip of, the, of a much bigger iceberg. There's so many men in our society, as Rob suggested earlier, who are living lives of quiet desperation. And if not, even if they're not violent, they in so many ways internalize so many problematic attitudes and beliefs. And in so many ways, their lives are shells of what they could be. And, the, and some of those men act out in ways that harm not just themselves, but all the people around them. This, this, is, this is a teachable moment where we could be having a conversation about this in a way that could bring us a, a further step. But um, we have to be much more uh, creative and entrepreneurial if we want to get these ideas out into the larger population. In the proud social justice tradition, right, that so many of us adhere to, in the civil rights struggles, all kinds of different uh, struggles against uh, gay and lesbian oppression and everything else, the basic concept is if you're a member of a dominant group, if you're a white person, if you're a heterosexual person, if you're a man, and you yourself aren't acting out abusively towards a member of the subordinated group, but you don't speak up in the face of others' abusive behavior, then your silence is a form of consent and complicity in others' abuse and racism and violence and heterosexism and sexism, right? It's like Desmond Tutu, one of the great leaders of the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa said, um, in situations of oppression, those who remain neutral take the side of the oppressor, right? And I know most men that I know, men across the racial and ethnic spectrum, across the sexual orientation spectrum, most men that I know are good men who don't want to be part of a system of abuse and harassment and violence, but a lot of them haven't spoken up you know, so their friend tells a rape joke and they don't say anything, or their colleague enacts a, a, a sexist policy and they don't really say anything because they don't really want to get involved. That's got to change. We need men to break our complicit silence. And again, it's not just 16-year-old boys or 20-year-old college students. We need adult men in positions of institutional power and authority to break our complicit silence and to challenge each other as well as to provide leadership for younger men. If you haven't been one of those guys yet, just start it right now, you know? It really makes, you know, it's really as simple as that. It'll get easier as you do it, the more you do it. I urge you to do it. You're in a community of a lot of supported, supportive people, both women and men, in, in this room as well as around this Western Mass and around the world. And then going forward, over the next generation, if you will, with the leadership of these young people and others, women and men, um, maybe 25 years from now, we'll be able to look back at the late 20th and early 21st century and say, oh my God, it was crazy back then. How much violence and how much sexism, race, you know, excuse me, rape and, and domestic violence, but we turned the corner. But it would only be because of the leadership of, of women and men working together. Good luck and thank you very much. <laughs>